Greetings, netizens of YouTube. It has come to my attention that anti-intellectualism is experiencing a renaissance in recent times. Nowhere is this more evident than on social media like YouTube, where the supposedly apolitical generalist is celebrated as one of us and the academic is considered to have a political agenda or to be out of touch with real people. You may think this celebration of amateurism over specialization cuts across political lines, then I'm about to claim that those on the political left are not part of this tendency, but you'd be wrong. Wikipedia defines anti-intellectualism as hostility towards and mistrust of intellect, intellectuals and intellectual pursuits, usually expressed as the derision of education, philosophy, literature, art and science as impractical and contemptible. In public discourse, anti-intellectuals are usually perceived and publicly present themselves as champions of the common folk, populists against political elitism and academic elitism, proposing that the educated are a social class detached from the everyday concerns of the majority and that they dominate political discourse and higher education. The most complete work on anti-intellectualism was by a leading authority on the subject, Richard Hofstadter. His Pulitzer Prize winning book, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, remains relevant today, more than 50 years after it was published. Hofstadter claimed that anti-intellectualism in America has historically been pervasive but isn't dominant. He defines anti-intellectualism as resentment and suspicion of the life of the mind and of those who are considered to represent it and a disposition constantly to minimize the value of that life. Daniel Rigney summarized three types of anti-intellectualism based on Hofstadter. A. Anti-rationalism B. Anti-elitism and C. Unreflective instrumentalism. Anti-rationalism is defined as professors being cold, distant and lacking a moral compass. Anti-elitism suggests that academics see themselves as better than the common person and are out of touch with reality. And unreflective instrumentalism is evident when academics focus on impractical research topics. Paranoia is also part of the anti-intellectualist's cookbook, according to Hostatter. But rather than set out to encourage anti-intellectualism deliberately, the anti-intellectualist taps into existing sentiments to justify a theory of, quote, a vast and sinister conspiracy that is set in motion to undermine and destroy a way of life. Hofstadter states that, quote, while anti-intellectualism has always been present in American culture, its intensity is subject to cyclical fluctuations. I believe that were he around today, he would note that we are at a high ebb of anti-intellectualism, both in what we see for what passes for debate in online platforms and in terms of the mass media. But I'll return to this shortly. Perhaps one of the best-known intellectuals of our times, Noam Chomsky, provides a countervailing viewpoint. Chomsky defines intellectuals as part of a privileged, moderately liberal, self-interested elite that often advises governments and appears in and is supported by the mainstream media. At the same time, those who oppose the intellectual mainstream are demonized or sidelined by the press. Chomsky's objections are twofold. Firstly, he believes that the intellectual status as a professional thinker requires support from the ruling class willing to fund them. Thus, for Chomsky, most intellectuals, in order to maintain their profession, must not be overly critical of the existing power structure. His second objection is to the idea that ordinary people are unable to grasp complex concepts or are devoid of critical thinking skills. Chomsky has stated that anti-intellectualism is not necessarily a bad thing. He believes that elites should be opposed and face criticism. But it's important to remember that Chomsky's definition of intellectualism, in an almost pejorative sense, is not the same as most definitions. Thus, his position on anti-intellectualism also differs. Chomsky contends that the capitalist stroke neoliberal system is pervasive in all sectors of society. 
Unlike mainstream anti-intellectuals or those that tap into populist sentiments on this platform, he does not believe that so-called SJWs, regressives or cultural Marxists control governments, universities and the media. The irony in Chomsky's view is that his own existence and that of similar intellectuals provides proof that the intellectual class doesn't have to be agents of the current system. Ironic in a different way is that Chomsky is often derided by those ordinary folk who do not have a clue that he is representing them. They consider him an out-of-touch leftist, while these same individuals frequently lionise those who are working against their interests. And yet, Chomsky doesn't condemn their sentiments with their roots in anti-intellectualism. While Hodstatter provided the most detailed description of anti-intellectualism, he could not have envisaged the extent of the commercial benefit behind its promotion that we see today. There are swathes of entertainment masked as information based on anti-intellectualism. Decades ago, it was the shock jocks on the radio with their conspiracies of end times and mistrust of all institutions, or preachers on cable television fleecing their viewers with their false miracles. Today, they have moved to YouTube to ply their wares. Those like Alex Jones with their FEMA camps are more obvious. But what of those that allege conspiracies of how shadowy leftist regressives control or manipulate governments, the media, universities and some corporations? There are tens of thousands of presumably rational people who have swallowed this narrative. A narrative which, by any definition, taps into anti-intellectualism and is told by the unqualified on a for-profit basis in new media. In his book, Idiot America, Charles Pierce says, The rise of Idiot America, though, is essentially a war on expertise. It's not so much anti-modernism or the distrust of the intellectual elites that Richard Hofstadter teased out of the national DNA, although both of these things are part of it. The rise of Idiot America today reflects for profit, mainly, but also, and more cynically, for political advantage and in the pursuit of power, the breakdown of the consensus that the pursuit of knowledge is a good. It also represents the ascendancy of the notion that the people we should trust the least are the people who know best what they're talking about. In the new media age, everybody is a historian, or a scientist, or a preacher, or a sage. And if everybody is an expert, then nobody is. And the worst thing you can be in a society where everybody is an expert is, well, an actual expert. Educated experts, along with mainstream news outlets and other cultural institutions, are dismissed and discredited as being complicit in a larger master plan, controlled from afar, as Gregory Fave puts it. That isn't to say that the mainstream media doesn't deserve criticism or cynicism, but the idea of throwing out established institutions wholesale in favour of some bloke vlogging from his bedroom seems somewhat foolhardy. Pierce contends that reason and logic-based explanations can be cast aside by any theory as long as it sells and is shouted loudly enough. He states that motivation for greater influence higher ratings or higher profit is at odds with the nuanced intellectual approach. This seems like an all too familiar description of content creators on this platform, although you will be interested to know that Pierce doesn't mention YouTube in his book. So much then for the free marketplace of ideas or the appeal to the number fallacy for that matter. A subset of anti-intellectualism is denialism, which D. Telm and McKee outline in their research paper Denialism, what it is and how should scientists respond. They define denialism as including conspiracy theories, false experts, cherry-picking of evidence, misrepresentation and logical fallacies. Classic examples of denialism include Holocaust denialists or those that deny evolution. A more interesting and controversial subject is the opposition to genetically modified foods as an example of denialism. On that one, I plead guilty with mitigating circumstances. 
with a defence that the jury is still out and that those with a huge financial interest have been tampering with the evidence and bribing witnesses. But on our own platform, we frequently see social science denialism, where those that specialise in branches of the humanities are condemned as being lesser experts or outright frauds for the sin of not specialising in the far worthier hard sciences. We see false experts misrepresenting their opponents. We see one-sided cherry-picking of evidence, conspiracies and logical fallacies. Denialists swap open-minded scepticism with the infallible certainty of ideological commitment. It is not necessary to have a specific ideology to be a denialist. It is only necessary to hold an unthinking ideological commitment to a subject or subjects. Author Michael Spector writes that denialists use arguments that contain fractions of accurate information that are taken out of context or one-sidedly selective. As for those who fall victim to denialism, Spectre says, People fall into the denialist trap when they are struggling with change, or the perception of change. Rather than face reality, they turn to a comfortable lie. Denialism is not deliberate anti-intellectualism. Rather, anti-intellectualism is a byproduct of it. A major factor that has seen an increase of anti-intellectualism in recent years has been the democratisation of information. Ostensibly the revolutionary dawn of the internet and the unparalleled access to information it affords is a massive benefit. But why would I need an expert to lecture me on high with their complexities and nuances when I have Wikipedia? On this platform, the same kind of sentiment is manifested by those who believe talking into a camera after watching a few YouTube videos makes their viewpoint as authoritative as somebody who specialises in the subject or at the very least has spent many hours studying it. We are all experts now, with equally valid points of view, it would seem. Regular viewers would have noted previous references I've made to the dumbing down of culture with its ever-increasing emphasis on entertainment rather than on information and the cult of celebrity above the expert. Many others have noted these factors and connect them to anti-intellectualism. Ray Williams in Psychology Today states, there is a growing and disturbing trend of anti-intellectual elitism in American culture. It's the dismissal of science, the arts and humanities and their replacement by entertainment, self-righteousness, ignorance and deliberate gullibility. Susan Jacobi, author of The Age of American Unreason, says in an article in the Washington Post, Dumbness, to paraphrase the late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, has been steadily defined downward for several decades by a combination of heretofore irresistible forces. These include the triumph of video culture over print culture, a disjunction between Americans' rising level of formal education and their shaky grasp of basic geography, science and history, and the fusion of anti-rationalism with anti-intellectualism. Ray Williams goes on to connect rising anti-intellectualism in the US with declining educational standards in America relative to other countries. WhatWhenHow.com states, with public primary and secondary schooling driven to bankruptcy due to fiscal restructuring that relegated education to its lowest priority, the whole function of university education, anchored to its definitional demands for higher learning, is thus incapacitated. Although one surely finds anti-intellectual strains within academic ranks, of greatest concern regarding society's future is the increasing anti-intellectualism of the student population. This is manifested on campuses in myriad ways, from objections to types of courses and course materials to demands for uncritical expressions of opinion in the classroom in the name of objectivity or so-called balanced accounts. It is certainly no surprise that American academics and intellectuals of great stature are nowhere to be seen in the mass media. They are effectively censored. 
not merely because of their independent views, but also because of their refusal to speak in advertising slogans, because their language has been rendered incompatible with the media's current production values. Despite what we see on YouTube, mainly in anti-SJW circles or in real life, with the popularity of politicians like Sarah Palin or Donald Trump, it should be remembered that anti-intellectualism historically is not a left-right issue. Indeed, if we examine Marxist or far-left philosophy, the common man or worker is often venerated. The educated man or woman is not necessarily the ideal. The man in the street is more often painted in a noble light. Despite the fact that Marx himself said, quote, ignorance never helped anybody, there have always been elements of populist anti-intellectualism in the far left. The democratic socialist George Orwell actually mocks this sentiment in his novel 1984, with our naive hero Winston repeatedly stating that the decent or uncorrupted proletariat will rise to sweep away Big Brother's system. Partially satisfied with the limited freedom they have, but with no access to uncensored information, of course, they never do. Chomsky's view somewhat incorporates this ideal, although without romanticising the common man. Rather, Chomsky believes that ordinary people are more than capable of critical thought, provided society provides conditions in which critical thought can flourish. I think that Chomsky's critique of intellectualism has merit and I share Chomsky's implied sentiment that it is easy for the educated class to consider their uneducated peers as less intelligent, when in fact less academically gifted people often possess intelligence in other areas. As far as critical thinking skills are concerned, it would be interesting to see if exposure to academic education improves this ability, as is often assumed, or impedes it, compared to the rest of the population. Hostatter mentions how anti-intellectualism and anti-elitism can be found in labour unions and even in education where the left dominates. According to Hostatter, anti-intellectualism can also be found among those that promote good causes because, as he puts it, of our passion for equality. Yes, Hostatter is talking about people like me and quite possibly you. Finally, I'd like to touch upon one last point that Hofstadter made. Quote, American anti-intellectuals have consistently seen intellect as opposed to feeling, character, practicality and democracy. This is an interesting sentiment, considering online interactions where one is told that feelings don't matter, that the intellectualism some claim to represent is based upon logic and practicality rather than sensitivity or empathy. The research for this video was quite an eye-opener for me because of just how relevant it seemed when applied to this platform. Of course, my view is still somewhat myopic. But what I have done here and what I endeavour to do with most of my serious videos is to provide multiple sources and some kind of dissenting view. This is not something I see often among those that oppose social justice on this platform, many of whom I believe are intellectually lazy, somewhat dishonest and driven by popularity above all else. YouTube is primarily an entertainment platform, but these YouTubers don't seem to understand that even if there is a small trade-off between honesty and popularity, it's worth going the extra mile. I am concerned by the way that people trust their e-celebs and entertainers, the way they swallow and repeat their one-sided and cherry-picked talking points ad nauseum. YouTube increasingly has become a refuge from the real world by those that feel disenfranchised, rather than a true reflection of that world. But rather than sign off with finger pointing, I'm going to close with a quote we should all consider from Ortega's Revolt of the Masses. The individual finds himself already with a stock of ideas. He decides to content himself with them and to consider himself intellectually complete. As he feels the lack of nothing outside himself, he settles down definitely amid his mental furniture. 
Such is the mechanism of self-obliteration. <laughs>